This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Here it is, Saturday night again, in time for our weekly visit with that excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in the old familiar study, so let's waste no time in joining him. Good evening, Mr. Bell. You're punctual to the minute, as usual. You bet I am. When it's time for Dr. Watson to tell a new adventure he had with the immortal Sherlock Holmes, I'm not going to miss a <laughs> second nice of it. Nice of you to say, sir, my boy. Drop your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Before I sit down, Dr. Watson, you mind if I take a look at the old metal case on the mantelpiece? wasn't there last week. No, I placed it there because it played a prominent part in tonight's story. You see, it's a memento of yet another encounter that Sherlock Holmes and I had with the arch-villain of London crime, Professor Moriarty. But what is it, Dr. Watson? It looks like an old compass. That's exactly what it is, my boy. But there are no numerals on it. Just these strange figures around the dial. Well, oh, those apparent hieroglyphics helped us to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. I call it the adventure... Of the half-eaten apple, the Coptic compass, and the unclothed corpse. I can hardly wait, Doctor. Well, I'm sure you'll wait long enough to have a word with our listeners now, won't you, Mr. Bell? <laughs> right. Men, aren't you sick and tired of hair preparations which leave your hair looking and feeling greasy? When you run your hand over your hair, does your hair feel sticky and dirty? Does grease come off on your hand? If so, then now's the time to change to Kreml hair tonic. The first thing you'll notice about Kreml is how clean it smells, how clean it looks and feels on your hair and scalp. When you use Kreml, you can run your hand over your hair. And honestly, men, it's a pleasure. Not a trace of that greasy, sticky feeling. Yet you can't beat Kreml to keep hair neatly groomed. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair in place longer, with such a natural, well-groomed appearance. So, men, let Kreml give your hair this handsome, clean-cut look which is bound to make a hit, both on the job and with the ladies. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how's about the compass, the half-eaten apple, and the... And the unclothed corpse? <laughs> well, Mr. Bell, the adventure began on a November morning shortly after the turn of the century. Holmes, seldom won to indulge in exercise... For its own sake, had displayed a rare burst of activity and joined me in a stroll through Regent's Park. Just before noon, we retraced our steps, and as we turned the corner into Baker Street, I nearly collided with a tall, well-dressed man walking in the other direction. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Oh, it's quite all right, sir. Excuse me. Aren't you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. I'm Major Stanley. Indeed. You're a little, little early for our appointment, Major Stanley. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Dr. Watson. I am early, Mr. Holmes, and when your housekeeper told me you were still out, I decided to take a stroll. Then let's walk back together, and perhaps you can tell me your problem as we go. It isn't exactly my problem, Mr. Holmes. You see, I made the count to the Maharaja of Kasul. Oh, really? It's a very interesting job, I should imagine. Uh, yes, it is. You did. know, I was in India myself, uh, for Shawa and further north. I was oh, once attacked uh, by... Quite, uh, Watson. Some uh, other time, don't you think? Oh, sorry, Holmes. The so Maharaja's problem would seem pressing since his emissary has been so eager to reach us. Uh, please continue, Major Stanley. Uh, Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of the Star of Kasu? A fabulously valuable diamond, isn't it? Yes. It's the treasure of the Maharaja's collection. At the moment, it's in the vaults of the Bank of England. No, it's the best place for it, I should say. There have been several jewel robberies lately. Yes, so I've been told, and that's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. You see... The Maharaja has come to England to have his portrait painted by Sergeant. Your problem becomes apparent, Major Stanley. When this portrait is painted, the Star of Kasul will no doubt be set in the Maharaja's turban. And you quite justifiably feel concerned about the jewel's safety. Exactly, Mr. Holmes. It must be cleverly and closely guarded on its daily journey from the vaults to the Maharaja's suite and back. Well, hardly sounds like a job for you, Holmes. No, Major Stanley. Without wishing to appear conceited, I may say that such a routine matter is rather outside my scope. The Maharaja insists on having you, Mr. Holmes. I assure you his fee would be princely. Uh, here we are, 221B. Come in, Major Stanley. We'll discuss the matter further, if you like. Mrs. Hudson, 
We're back. Oh, very well, Doctor. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, there were two gentlemen waiting to see you. Said they had an appointment, but they've gone. Said they'd come back later. Uh, did they leave their names? No, sir, they didn't. Oh, that's odd. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Hi, sir. Let's go upstairs, shall we, Major Stanley? Very well, Doctor. Regarding your problem, Major Stanley, it occurs to me that Humphrey Pedder might be a good man to see. Humphrey Pedder? Yes, I'm not personally acquainted with him, but I'm told that he specializes in the uh, uh, more physical aspects of detective work. The Maharaj will be very distressed if you refuse him, Mr. Holmes. Naturally, I wish to... Uh... I'm sorry, Major Stanley. I've made my decision. I can't handle the case. See Mr. Pedder, if you will. Well, but, Mr. Holmes, uh, can't, can't we sit down and talk about it at least? Yes, Holmes. After all, there's no need to be rude. I'm afraid not. Good day, Major. Well, I, I've heard you were eccentric, Mr. Holmes, but I, I didn't know how eccentric. Holmes, what on earth's the matter with you? You ask him up, and then you won't even let him in, uh, into the room. For an excellent reason, Watson. Come inside. Look, there on the floor. Great heavens. I could hardly let the emissary of a Raja walk into a room containing a corpse, and an unclothed one at that. Lift the blanket off the face, Watson. Right, you are, huh? Yeah. Oh, Doctor. The poor man. Is that the face of one of the men that crawled here? Aye, sir, it is. Cover it again, Watson. I saw the other one leave, sir. He said his friend had already left. Oh, I never dreamed now, This that... one you saw leaving, was he carrying anything? A bundle, perhaps? No, sir, he wasn't. Could you describe him? Well, he was tall and thin... And he had a but high If he was carrying him. no bundle, where are the corpses' clothes? There's no sign of them in here. What a shocking thing, sir. A murder right in your living room. Will I send for the police? Definitely not, Mrs. Hudson. And please keep this to yourself. Aye, sir. When a corpse is deposited on my own carpet, there's a certain point of honor in being able to present the police with a complete explanation when I do call them in. Uh, that'll be all, Mrs. Hudson. All right, sir. What a terrible thing. Holmes, this is incredible. Why leave a corpse here and... And why unclothed? The obvious reason to remove clothing would be to make identification difficult. And how did the murderer get the clothes out of here? Mrs. Hudson said that he wasn't carrying anything. We have many other questions to answer, old chap. The knife wound in the heart gives us no clue, I'm afraid. But observe the singular collection of objects that are lying beside the body. Well, let's have a look at them. A railway ticket, a funny-looking compass... And an apple that has been bitten into. The corpse has protruding teeth. I bet you that he didn't make the bite in this apple... Holmes, these must be the murderer's tooth marks. If you're correct, Watson, our murderer is an extraordinary man indeed. Well, why do you say that? Because if you look closely, you'll notice the interesting fact that this bite was made by two sets of upper teeth. <laughs> you're, you're the one and no mistake, Professor Moriarty. <laughs> two sets of upper teeth. Well, that was the best touch. Yes, Carter. I must confess it was neat. Simple, of course. You start the bite with your upper teeth, reverse the apple, and conclude the bite. <laughs> yes, simple. But I trust also somewhat disconcerting for the great Sherlock Holmes. Our past encounters have given me an insight into his very unusual mind. I'd like to watch his face when he walked in there, Professor. So would I. But the next 24 hours will give me little leisure, I fear. I must arrange for a certain matter concerning a change of ownership in the Star of Kasul. This should be a fascinating game. But the old compass, the railway ticket. Carter, with your somewhat limited cranial development, it must be hard for you to absorb the subtler points in such a plan, but surely its basic purpose is obvious. Sherlock Holmes is about to be engaged by the Maharaja to guard the jewel. I had to divert his attention, so I perpetrated an intriguing murder on his own doorstep and surrounded the corpse with meaningless and completely unrelated objects which I knew would torment his curiosity and keep him off my trail. And that corpse would take some explaining to the police too, Professor. Yes, that's why I placed it there. It puts him in an acutely embarrassing position. He has to try and solve the case or become the laughing stock of London. <laughs> it's one of your neatest jobs, Professor. Oh, I won't say that, Carter. But I'm quite sure that I've posed a problem that Sherlock Holmes will be totally unable to resist. Mm -hmm. 
I can't resist this problem, Watson. No fee on earth could make me bother with the safety of a mere diamond when such a puzzle presents itself. On my soul, you talk rather as though you were settling down to a game of chess. You've got to solve this problem, Holmes, or else it's going to put you in a ridiculous position with Scotland Yard. And just think if it got into the papers. I shall reserve my imagination for the problem posed. The question of the apple is, of course, obvious. Well, I suppose all you have to do is to find a man with two sets of false upper teeth. <laughs> Very simple. Quite. The only way such an imprint could be left is to take a half bite with the upper teeth. Reverse the apple and repeat the procedure. The only question here is, why indulge in such a bizarre performance? Well, whatever the reason, those are the murderer's tooth marks. Unquestionably. You notice the eaten portion of the apple has only just commenced to turn brown. The bite was undoubtedly taken in this room. But to identify teeth marks is a monumental problem and might prove insoluble. Let's turn our attention to the compass for a moment. Well, I've never seen one like it. There are no numerals on it, no points of the compass indicated anywhere. Just a lot of funny little squiggles. Oh, no, Watson. Surely you recall the singular affair of the Coptic patriarchs? You overrate my memory, Holmes. In any case, I don't even know what a Copt is. My dear Watson, sometimes you astound me. Well, it seems to me it takes very little to astound you. I repeat, what is a Copt? The Copts are the principal Christian race descended from ancient Egyptian stock. What you refer to as squiggles on this compass, in reality, are letters of the Coptic alphabet. Well, that makes it more confusing than ever. An apple bitten into by an eccentric and now a compass with ancient Egyptian lettering on it. I just can't see any relation between the two of them. And yet we know there must be. That's what makes the problem so fascinating. Well, what does the compass tell you, Holmes? Two things. The Coptic lettering on the dial is inscribed by hand. Obviously, it was constructed for a Copt who could speak no European language. Yes, the corpse was definitely not of Egyptian origin. I'll wager that he was born not too far away from the sound of Bow Bells. I agree, Watson. And so the problem becomes more confusing. Now, uh, let us examine another piece of this fascinating puzzle. The railway ticket. Well, it's the unused return half of a first-class ticket from the village of Chipping Sodbury to London. Yes, and the date stamped on the back is November the 6th. Today? Yes, Watson, today. Chipping Sodbury is a tiny village. I imagine that the number of passengers that travelled from there to London this morning could be counted on one hand. You're going to Chipping Sodbury? Yes. It shouldn't be too hard to find out who purchased this ticket. And while I'm doing that, I want you to stand guard here. Oh, 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 with the corpse? Yes, Watson. And I suggest that you keep your revolver handy. My revolver? You mean that I... I mean that after what has happened in one short morning in Baker Street, we shall be prepared for any eventuality. <laughs> just a moment, we'll see just what eventualities do develop. But first, if you're smart, you'll take better care of the hair you've got. And let me assure you, men, you can't use a better product than Cremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which no other hair tonic has. That is why Cremel keeps your hair in place longer. Why your hair always has such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never greasy or sticky. And listen carefully to this man. Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kreml stimulates the circulation of blood right in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated, how clean your scalp feels. At the same time, Kreml removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls, Kreml actually helps condition the hair by making it feel softer, more pliable. So men... Why be satisfied with a product which merely keeps your hair in place when you can have handsomely groomed hair plus all those extra advantages of Kreml? Buy a bottle as soon as possible at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, it seems to me that Professor Moriarty did quite a job in sending you and Sherlock Holmes off on a false trail. He did, Mr. Bell, and for a while his nefarious plan succeeded. But to take up the story where I left off, while I stood guard in Baker Street over the mysterious corpse, Holmes caught the next train for the tiny village of Chipping Sodbury. He told me that after a talk with the village station master, he had no trouble in tracing the purchaser of the first-class railway ticket that we'd found beside the body. It had been bought by a dignified an elderly clergyman by the name of Russell. And Holmes lost no time in calling on it. The station master told me, sir, that you were the only person to purchase a return first-class ticket to London this morning. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I had occasion to make one of my rare excursions to London this morning. 
But though it was an unfortunate experience for me, I can't think my humble visit to the city could be a matter of any possible interest to you. I'm very interested in what happened to the return half of your railway ticket, sir. Very odd you should mention that. A regrettable business. Most regrettable. It was stolen from me by a pickpocket, together with my watch and chain. Didn't notice it until I had occasion to look at the time when I was lunching with the Bishop of St. Luke's. You've no idea when or where the theft took place, sir? I walked from the station. The crowds were quite dense, and I do recall being jostled rather heavily on one occasion. You reported your loss to the police, I suppose. Naturally. But I have little hope that they'll catch the criminal. Most regrettable business. Cost me a watch and the price of another ticket. An expensive lesson in the frailty of human nature. Do you uh, care for a cup of tea, Mr. Holmes? Uh, No, thank you. I'm afraid I haven't time. I must return to London on the next train. Urgent and unfinished business awaits me there. Followed Sherlock Holmes to Paddington Station, Professor Moriarty. Excellent. He caught the train for Chipping Sudbury, no doubt, Carter. Oh, yes, Professor. A fat lot of good that'll do him, even if he does find the old clergyman we pinched the stuff from. Mm, but it consumed valuable time. Time during which I can complete our plans regarding the star of Kursul. Before midnight tonight, I think I can safely say that the jewel will be in our hands. <laughs> How very fortunate that Sherlock Holmes has such a devouring curiosity. Any luck, Holmes? A waste of valuable time, Watson. I found the purchase of the ticket all right. The return half, together with his watch, had been stolen by a pickpocket. Oh, Lord, so that means we start all over again. No, Watson. At least one clue has been eliminated. Let us analyze the remaining ones more thoroughly. Now, the problem of the Coptic compass should next engage our attention. A call on the Egyptian embassy might prove illuminating. You know, Holmes, while you were away, I had a brainwave. Congratulations. It was connected with the missing clothes from the corpse. Where, I asked myself, where would be the obvious place to hide clothes? Why, in in the clothes closet, of course. So I searched both our wardrobes absolutely thoroughly... They weren't there. Interesting, Watson. Of course, I'd already done the same thing. Oh, well. The problem of the missing clothes is still... Numbskull. Yes, Holmes? Why didn't I think of it before? What is it, Holmes? The special wardrobe that I keep for my disguises. In the dressing room. Come on, Watson. By Jove, yes, I, I never thought of that. Perfect place for hiding the dead man's clothes. Let's see if there have been any recent additions to this raggledy collection of mine. Costa's outfit. There's a clergyman's suit. You always made a surprisingly convincing clergyman, Holmes. And here's the unfailing passport to many a servant's back door. The stained and roughened worsteds of the English plumber. Yes, these patched and frayed ghosts could tell many a tale of... Hello. Look here, Watson. Plain blue suit in rather good condition. Quite. And it doesn't belong in my collection. I think we've solved the mystery of the vanishing clothes. The labels have been ripped out of the coat. Yes. And the pockets emptied. All possible identification removed. We're getting warm, Watson. We're getting very warm. Wait a minute. What is it? Give me a knife. All right, sir. There's something in the lining of this coat. Feels like paper. Perhaps the murderer didn't remove all identification after all. Uh, Here you are. These scissors will do the trick. Splendid. There we are. Piece of paper sewn to the padding of the coat. Yes. Let's see what it tells us. Humphrey Pedder, 118 Montague Crescent, Knightsbridge. That's the private detective you were talking about earlier on today. Do you suppose that Pedder's the corpse? At this stage, Watson, I shall suppose nothing. We'll go to Montague Crescent and find out for ourselves. Mr. Pedder, I can't say how glad I am that we found you alive and well. From what you gentlemen have told me, Doctor, I feel glad myself to be here. Is it your custom to have an extra identification label sewn into all your clothes, Mr. Perron? Yes, Mr. Holmes. A detective never knows what may happen to him. I've always felt such identification might be valuable. A very sound precaution. Thank you, sir. 
And you say that a suit of your clothes was stolen from your wardrobe last night? Yes. And I can't unearth a clue. Embarrassing situation for a detective, Mr. Holmes. Yes, it certainly is. Though I'm sure in your position, you've never had a thing like that happen to you. I um, doubt, Mr. Pedder, if you know just how embarrassing a detective's life may become. <laughs> yes, indeed. Take our present situation, for instance. Quite, I... Watson. Mr. Pedder. I can't get a word in it, George. Did Major Stanley call on you today? I suggested that you would be eminently suited to the task of guarding the Maharaja's diamond. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'm going over to the Savoy tonight to talk to the Maharaja. Much obliged to you for giving me the recommendation. Particularly since I've never had the privilege of meeting you. I'd heard very flattering reports of your ability. I'm very glad, Mr. Holmes. Your recommendation means a lot to me. Well, Holmes, we've drawn another blank. Yes, Watson. I fear we must return to Baker Street and see if an ancient compass can point the way to the solution. Wait, you, sir. The Egyptian Embassy in Grosvenor Square, cabby. Watch your government. Jump in, Watson. I feel a blasted fool trotting around London with a Coptic compass under my arm. I hope this leads us somewhere. If the excursion proves fruitless, Watson, I'm afraid I shall be compelled to get in touch with Scotland Yard. A few hours delay in reporting a murder can be explained, but beyond that, we may find ourselves in trouble. Well, I think you should have reported it before this. By the way, Holmes, did you notice the broom and pair that drove up to Pedder's house just as we left? I'm afraid for once I was sufficiently preoccupied to yield to you in observation, my dear Watson. I'm not certain, but I thought that it was Major Stanley who, who stepped out of it. Major Stanley? And yet Mr. Pedder said that... But of course, what an idiot I've been. Cabby, cabby! Yes, sir? Turn around and drive us to the Savoy Hotel as fast as you can. What you want, isn't it? But uh, why the Savoy Hotel, Holmes? Surely the situation is crystal clear now, Watson. Just about as clear as porridge to me. The whole thing's a plot to fool me. Tell me, Watson, what is suggested to you by the combination of an unclothed corpse, a stolen suit, and a railroad ticket? Well, if I knew the answer, Holmes, I'd have given it to you this morning and saved ourselves a lot of trouble. The answer, Watson, is organization. A group of well-organized criminals who are able to perform these unrelated tasks. And who is the only person in London who can arrange for running the criminal gamut from murder to plain pickpocketing? Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? Of course. Remember Mrs. Hudson's description of our visitor? Tall, thin, and with a high forehead. And if you add organization and Moriarty to Major Stanley, the Maharaja of Kursul, and a portrait painter, the sum total should be apparent. You mean that you've solved the problem of the unclothed corpse? I mean I know precisely how Professor Moriarty intends to steal the star of Kursul. Master Caddy, there's not a moment to lose. Mr. Holmes, it's an astonishing story you've told me. At least it explains my apparent rudeness this morning, Major Stanley. You can appreciate the embarrassing position in which my friend was placed, sir. You, yes, indeed. But, but of course, you understand that Mr. Pedder here is now in charge of guarding the Star of Kasul. Quite, Major. And uh, you're in very excellent hands, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. But your own problem still fascinates me. The unclothed corpse, the compass, and the apple. As a humble exponent of your profession, I'm curious to see how you arrived at your conclusions. I reached them only just in time, Mr. Pedder. If I hadn't, I should at this moment be paying a fruitless visit to the Egyptian embassy. Well, I'm still confused, Holmes. And yet the answer is simple. What was outstanding about the crime committed at Baker Street? What was its uh, individual peculiarity? Well, I suppose the air of mystery that surrounded it. I prefer to use the word mystification. The crime fascinated me, stimulated me, as Professor Moriarty hoped it would, until I realized that it was intended to do precisely that. The whole plan was a decoy, designed to prevent me from accepting your mission, Major Stanley. How could I accept such a commonplace job as guarding a jewel while such a fascinating problem was presented in my own living room? And the apple and the compass Fictional were... clues that led nowhere, but were sufficiently challenging for the criminal to know I wouldn't be able to resist tracking them down. It's an amazing plot. And the railway ticket and the suit of clothes that were stolen from me were all meant to focus your attention elsewhere and away from the diamond. Exactly, Mr. Pedder. Well, Mr. Holmes, I assure you we are very grateful for the warning. Yes. We shall be more than ever on our guard now. We know where the danger is coming from, Professor Moriarty. I'm taking the Star of Cross you back to the Bank of England in a few minutes. I assure you that I shall guard it extremely well. I think, Mr. Pedder, that if you don't mind, I'll take charge of the stone. But, Mr. Holmes, I've already been commissioned for the work. That's true, Mr. Holmes. Since you refused the job, I had to make other arrangements. Mr. Pedder was your own suggestion for the assignment. Nonetheless, Major, 
I think the Maharaja will sleep much more comfortably if I take charge of the stone. Holmes, I don't think it's very ethical. After all, you did refuse to take on the case, you know. This is hardly a time for ethics, Watson. Where is the Star of Kasul, Major Stanley? I just handed it over to Mr. Pedder before you arrived. Then supposing you give it to me, Mr. Pedder. By the way, I don't have the pleasure of knowing your royal name. But Holmes, he's Humphrey Pedder. Oh, no, Watson. The unclothed corpse of Humphrey Pedder still lies in Baker Street. This is one of Professor Moriarty's most trusted henchmen. You're too smart for your own good. Look out, he's got a revolver. A little slow in drawing it. A beautiful uppercut, Holmes. Send for the police, please, Major Stanley. We have a prize catch for them here. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I can't tell you how grateful I am. I'll take the liberty of removing the diamond from the pocket of our recumbent friend. There we are. Behold, Watson, the Star of Kasul. What a magnificent stone. Magnificent. And yet one man was murdered for it. I only wish another might hang because of it. But Moriarty still goes free. And he killed Pedder. We'll catch him, Watson. We'll catch him. He is getting clumsy. If he'd noticed the credentials in Pedder's clothes, he would have been in possession of this bauble before the night is out. Instead of which, the evidence of this man here may help us to trap him. I hope so, Watson. But Moriarty inspires his henchmen with such loyalty that I doubt if he'll give us much help. The jewel is safe. Our own peculiar problem is solved. And we've captured a prize villain. Next time, we shall capture the master himself. <laughs> Did you, Dr. Watson? Did I what, Mr. Bell? Did you and Holmes finally capture Professor Moriarty, the master himself? No, Mr. Bell, haven't you uh, got a word for our listeners? <laughs> yes, I have. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, here's some advice from one of America's foremost beauty authorities, John Robert Powers. Mr. Powers tells his famous million-dollar Powers models to use only cremel shampoo to wash their hair. And how right Mr. Powers is. Because cremel shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to its own natural, glossy luster. It leaves the hair shining bright for days. Just a vision of beauty. You know, cremel shampoo is great for washing children's hair, too. Yes. Its luxurious, active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Cremel shampoo never dries the hair. So, ladies, buy a bottle at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to its natural shining glory. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week I think I'll tell you a story about a dowager dip. A dowager dip? What on earth is that? <laughs> That's a, a slang way of saying that our story concerns... A dowager duchess of Penfield, who had the misfortune of being a kleptomaniac. And the story also concerns the strange, and I must admit, embarrassing adventure of the elusive emerald. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. When Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the elusive emerald. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Many thanks to Cliff Thorsness for his excellent sound effects and a deep bow to Inspector Lestrade, portrayed so wonderfully by Lou Krugman. The two episodes you've just heard, Murder by Moonlight, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, and The Coptic Compass, starring Tom Conway and Nigel Bruce, are a 1989 copyrighted production of 221A Baker Street Associates. The Sherlock Holmes stories and the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John H. Watson were created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and are used with the kind permission of Dame Jean Conan Doyle. This is Harry Bartell. Thank you for listening.
Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.